This is In The Loop. I'm Christian Bryant, a man constantly wondering if his Twitter account will prevent him from running for public office someday. Here's what we got for y'all. Many GOP-led state houses are working to limit early voting and voting by mail. We'll tell you who's helping with that effort. And in our latest episode of our original documentary series, Shift, we'll take a look into the future of incarceration by going inside a prison that's doing things a little differently. But first, here's what you need to know right now. At 1.49 p.m., I received a frantic call from then Chief of United States Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, where he informed me that the security perimeter of the United States Capitol had been breached by hostile rioters. Testimony on Capitol Hill today is revealing new details of the January 6th attack on Congress in hopes of making sure that kind of security failure never happens again. General William Walker of the National Guard told lawmakers he immediately alerted senior army leadership of the request for help from Capitol Police, but unusual restrictions had him waiting three hours for approval that day. That's in stark contrast to the National Guard's near immediate response to racial justice protests in D.C. last summer. There's been a lot of finger pointing this week and last when security officials told Congress they did not receive the information they needed to adequately prepare for the riot. Today, the acting Homeland Security Chief had this to say. In 15 unclassified assessments, INA discussed the heightened threat environment and the potential for domestic violent extremists to mobilize quickly and attack large gatherings or government buildings. They were shared broadly with all levels of government, law enforcement partners, critical infrastructure, including through fusion centers nationwide. The vaccine timeline moved up significantly this week, but what does that mean for the pandemic overall? On Tuesday, President Joe Biden said the U.S. will have a large enough supply of COVID-19 vaccines to inoculate every adult in the nation by the end of May. Part of that has to do with the emergency use authorization of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and pharma company Merck helping to ramp up its production. The single dose vaccine is also easier to store and distribute than the other two shots. But there's still a dire need for more vaccination sites to open and for people who can properly administer those vaccines. Then you also have to factor in the people who may not even be trying to get a shot. A recent poll from the Associated Press showed a third of Americans were still skeptical about getting a vaccine. That matters because the ultimate end goal is to reach herd immunity in the US. Scientists still aren't sure the exact percentage to do that when it comes to COVID-19, but the estimates range from vaccinating 50 to 80% of the US population. Right now, roughly 8% of Americans are fully vaccinated. While we are making progress, health experts continue to warn we are not out of the woods yet. During Wednesday's COVID briefing, the CDC director stressed the importance of still wearing a mask regardless of a mandate. We are just on the verge of capitalizing on the culmination of a historic scientific success. The ability to vaccinate the country in just a matter of three or four more months. How this plays out is up to us. The next three months are pivotal. It's no secret Google loves to track what you're searching. You know how you browse a website for an item you might buy, then see it appear as an ad everywhere else? Google says it plans to stop doing that next year, citing privacy concerns. The world's biggest digital advertising company says it's working on new ad buying technologies to target ads without collecting information from people on other websites. Last year, Google also announced it would remove third-party cookies by 2022. These moves have the potential to reshape online advertising. Google accounted for 52% of last year's global digital ad spending, according to Jounce Media, a digital ad consultancy. Oh, and by the way, if you're curious to see what Google knows about you already, just check out your Google account and go to adsettings.google.com. That's where you can find a whole list of information that's collected on you based on your searches. I gotta say, I don't love that. Dozens of Republican-led state houses are working to restrict voting early or by mail, and they're getting help from some powerful places. Newsy's Patrick Terpstra tells us who is driving this push in many states to limit voting in future elections. 
Have a great day. Well-funded groups are backing efforts to tighten voting rules in 43 states. Early voting this way. Lobbying records we examined pull the curtain back on Opportunity Solutions Project. It's a nonprofit pressing for tougher election laws in about a dozen states, some of them 2020 battlegrounds with legislatures led by Republicans. Many, like Donald Trump, questioned the security of the last election, despite no evidence of widespread voter fraud. House File 590 is our election integrity bill. The group reported lobbying for a bill just passed in Iowa that would reduce early voting from 29 to 18 days and the time to request an absentee ballot while requiring more aggressive maintenance of voter rolls. Opportunity Solutions Project is also flexing political muscle in Georgia. We found it lists former Mississippi governor and ex-RNC chair Haley Barber among lobbyists working on elections reform in the Peach State. The secretary will unlock the machine. The Georgia Senate just approved a bill requiring more ID for absentee voters. Records show Opportunity Solutions Project lobbying in Pennsylvania and Texas, two more states considering new voting measures. We see it as an opportunity of, hey, people are talking about elections. There clearly are some things that need to be cleaned up or worked on. We could be better in some of these states. And he so says their aim is to restore confidence in elections. Making it easy to vote, hard to cheat. That's kind of how I think of it. They're tied to the Foundation for Government Accountability, an organization supporting conservative causes such as food stamp reform. IRS records show they received over $9 million in donations in 2018, the most recent year on file. What we don't know is who is contributing to them, helping fuel their national drive to change voting laws, which could make it harder for people to cast ballots. Uh, we take it really seriously to protect the privacy of our donors, uh, just like any other nonprofit does. Other groups pushing for stricter voting rules include the RNC and a new coalition of conservative groups led by former Trump Homeland Security official Ken Cuccinelli, known as the Election Transparency Initiative. But do they have influence? We, we've talked to a lot of different organizations and we're, we're listening. Texas Representative J.C. Jatan says feedback from outside groups was helpful as he put together four bills to tighten election rules. There, there are organizations uh, that, that are in communication with us, but the bills we put together uh, won't be uh, necessary bills by any specific organization. These are going to be ones that we, we determine uh, make sense. Vote no on HB 531. The other side has its own army of powerful interest groups saying the right to vote is under attack. Lobbying reports show branches of the AARP, ACLU, and NAACP all favoring bills to preserve and expand voter access. Patrick Terpstra, Newsy, Washington. Name this movie. His mama called him Clay, so I'ma call him Clay. Whitney Houston's version of The Greatest Love of All is amazing, but have you ever heard it covered by Jackson Heights' own Randy Watson? If not, you're missing out. Here's what's trending. Hey! What are you doing back here, you awesome. It's been 33 years, and Akeem, now king of Zamunda, is finally making his way back to America in the sequel to Coming to America called Coming to America. It makes sense when you see it written out. Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall are reprising some of their many unforgettable roles in the film and ahead of their release, revealing new information about the original film, like how comedian Louis Anderson became one of the only white folks in a mostly black cast. I uh, love Louis, but I think we were forced to put Louis in it. They gave me a list with three white guys and they said, who would you rather work with? News of a sequel started circulating in 2017 with more official announcements coming two years later. The original film was a box office success and developed a cult following over the last three decades. Coming to America will be available to stream on Amazon Prime Video on March 5th. All right, I might actually drop my SoundCloud link. The music streaming platform announced it'll start paying indie artists a share of their listener subscription fees. SoundCloud calls the new initiative fan-powered royalties, where artists can benefit directly from their listeners instead of getting a split from a larger pot based on streams, which mainly benefits larger artists. SoundCloud hasn't yet worked out a deal with Warner, Sony, or Universal, the three major record labels, but select indie artists can start benefiting from the system on April 1st, which means I have a month to get in the lab and make some new stuff. Alamo Drafthouse Cinema, a Texas-based theater chain where you can check out films on a full stomach, 
announced it's filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and permanently closing its popular downtown Austin location. Alamo Drafthouse Cinema founder Tim League said in a statement, These are difficult times, and during this bankruptcy, we will have to make difficult decisions about our lease portfolio. The Texas-based cinema chain has 40 locations across the country and will permanently close at least two other locations as a part of its restructuring. Movie theaters have struggled during this pandemic with business closures and delayed movie releases, but Alamo Drafthouse ain't going anywhere. The company is still planning to open a Brooklyn location and, despite the removal of a Texas mask mandate, is asking its guests to do the smart thing and adhere to their safety measures. Prison is a core part of America's criminal justice system, but more than ever, there's consensus around the idea of shaking that up and reforming that system. Questions around just how effective mass incarceration is at punishing and preventing crime has led many cities and states across the country to try something different. For Newsy's original documentary series, Shift, Jamal Andrus went inside one prison that's trying to do things differently. We're gonna chat with him about that, but first, here's a clip from that episode. Got some good and bad news. The bad news is, you're in prison. The good news is, you're lucky to be in this prison. It's actually doing rehabilitation. My name is Antonio Shodaro, and everybody in the prison call me Dread. Feel free to do the same. Now, you could come in as a convict, criminal, whatever word they want to use today, and leave here with something that's a career. They pay you to help you get your GED. <laughs> Need I elaborate anymore? And then if you're struggling or having a hard time understanding it, they pay a tutor while they pay you to help you get your GED. I mean, you have nothing but time. And whatever time you come in here for, you have that much time to work on you. Why not? <laughs> if you guys have any questions, I know you got another guy coming. Oh, Kobe Braun. Good to meet you. Yeah, nice Good to meet you. I'm the warden here. Okay. It's a sobering feeling walking into a prison. The pat down, the prison bars, the steel doors that close behind you. But once I got inside of North Dakota's preferred housing unit, it didn't take long to realize this was unlike any other prison I'd been to. In most prisons, structure and restrictions applied to just about everything eating, sleeping, recreation. Here, the opposite is true. Inmates can roam in and out of their cells and set their own schedules. They're given a key to their own cell door and even do their own laundry. They have movie nights, access to video games, and can order takeout for delivery six times a year. This prison is meant to mimic the outside world as much as possible. So that was a clip from our latest episode of Shift, and here to talk to us about that episode is Jamal Andrus. Jamal, thanks for joining us on ITL. In this episode, you go into a prison in North Dakota that really doesn't look like what we think of when we think of a prison. What was this experience like for you, and what sort of impact have facilities like this um, had on focusing, reintegrating people into society. You can't overstate how sort of shocking it is to show up to these different facilities. So one of them is this sort of minimum security facility, and that's the one that has essentially dorm rooms for the inmates that are there. And then for the medium security facility, you know, the people get a key to their rooms. Uh, they have these field activity days, all of these things that are just very non-traditional when you look at the incarceration space. And so they saw a 10% reduction in the recidivism rate for this particular facility. The other thing is there was less violence amongst the inmates and between staff and inmates. You know, if you can consistently keep the recidivism rate low and keep these incidents of violence uh, on the downward swing, that's a huge impact that I think will, you know, catch on across the country. What sort of changes has this particular prison seen because of and during the pandemic? For North Dakota in particular, a lot of those unique things that are different about the North Dakota State Penitentiary had to be suspended 
uh, unfortunately. So along with getting rid of some of these new things, uh, they had to take some of the steps that many jails and prisons across the country have had as well. So that means making people eat within their cells rather than in a, in a lunchroom of any kind uh, and shifting prisoners around to make sure no one is uh, du double booked inside of their cells. Can you sum up where public opinion is on criminal justice right now? and how that's changed in recent decades? If you look at things like the death penalty, mandatory minimums, uh, life sentences for juveniles, uh, and, and a host of other things, pu public opinion on those practices is steadily declining. 71% of Americans say it is important to reduce the prison population. That is a huge change from sort of the 90s era of tough on crime. And so that has made its way into the positions of powers. Jamal Andrus, thank you so much for your time and for your reporting. We appreciate it, my man. When you're back, we'll tell you about how one country is struggling with coronavirus cases and reinfections, while most of the world is seeing cases decline or level off. Brazil has struggled to get control of the coronavirus, and the country is setting records for deaths, while a new, more aggressive virus strain is probably reinfecting virus survivors. Newsy's Ben Chamisa spoke to Brazilian experts about the dire situation. As much of the world sees COVID-19 cases falling or leveling off, Brazil's outbreak is only getting worse. Hospitals are reaching maximum capacity, deaths are at a record high, and a more contagious variant is likely reinfecting people who already caught the virus. The level of desperation in Brazil is growing to unseen levels. Meanwhile, Brazil's right-wing president Jair Bolsonaro continues to downplay the severity of the virus and the efficiency of masks while attacking governors who impose restrictions. I think he's celebrating the spread of the virus. Uh, the more confusion there is, the better for him. A quick vaccination drive would be one way to tame the outbreak. But Bolsonaro has failed to secure enough doses, even suggesting that the Pfizer vaccine could turn people into crocodiles and refusing to get one himself. This country has uh, the ability of vaccinating over one million people per day. It has done so in previous vaccination efforts. So now we are vaccinating around uh, 160,000 a day, which is almost 10 times less than our capacity. Millions of street vendors have no choice but to continue exposing themselves to COVID-19 because a federal program helping vulnerable populations recently expired. And taking cues from their president, many Brazilians have been ignoring social distancing rules. They parted for New Year's as if nothing was happening in the world. That same happened in Carnival, even though most Brazilian cities banned public celebrations. There were still a lot of uh, illegal parties going on. Now, scientists are sounding the alarm about Brazil's pandemic mismanagement becoming a global threat as the more contagious variant is starting to show up in other countries, including in the US. Frankly, I think we need international pressure. I think we need, uh, I think the world should uh, look at us and say, listen, there's something really wrong going there. How can we help? Ben Chamiso, Newsy. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the loop. I would love postage, but I don't think I want y'all licking envelopes and then sending them to me. That don't seem right. Over the last year, the greatest threat to American safety has been the coronavirus. But the CDC budget for 2020, money that could have greatly helped with pandemic preparedness, was only a fraction of the budget approved for national defense spending. Newsy's Datalog series unpacks data journalism through conversations on a range of topics. Cody Legro explores how many lives could be saved and what would the impact be if the nation's budget treated public health like national security. About 24 bucks. It's the cost of a modest takeout order. It's also what states receive per person in grant money from the Center for Disease Control's programs last year. That's according to Trust for America's Health. But if you were in Canada, you'd get more than an entree. 
It spends about $7,000 per person via public health funding, and that's like 300 chicken pad thais. While the CDC's overall budget increased in fiscal year 2019 and 2020, its core budget has been essentially flat for the last decade. On Capitol Hill, that's led to exchanges like this. The CDC budget is $11 billion, 1.5% of our defense budget. Dr. Redfield, do you think our country would have been safer if, let's say, we had twice the CDC budget? For, you know, decades, we've underinvested in the public health infrastructure of this nation. This year, the greatest threat to American safety has been the public health crisis known as COVID-19, killing more Americans than every war since the Korean War combined. So we wanted to know, how many lives could be saved, and what would the impact be if our nation's budget treated public health like national security? The defense budget is $738 billion. This past year, the Trump administration budgeted for 79 F-35s, and the cost of one is $144 million. The Cato Institute says that's the same as 2,800 ventilators. The White House also asked for $3.5 billion for two Arleigh Burke destroyers for the Navy. One destroyer equals nearly 15,000 hospital beds. The budget also made room for modernizing 89 M1 Abrams tanks for $1.5 billion. For the record, the Army didn't even want this. The cost of one tank could buy 17 million N95 masks. So what would this public health as national defense mentality do for our virus-fighting firepower? We asked Dr. Anthony Fauci. Hello. Hello, Dr. Fauci. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Is there room in this country to develop a more robust biological defense system? Why or why not? Yeah, I mean, we have a program that we started uh, some time ago and was fortified by the threat of a pandemic flu, when we had the bird flu, that jump species, killed people. Luckily for us, it never developed an efficient capability of going from person to person. But it was a threat and it triggered what's called pandemic preparedness program, which is just what you're referring to. Just as you would put money into a Department of Defense, we put money into developing the infrastructure the stockpiles, the preparedness, the platforms for vaccine. We're holding our health department together with DOS and duct tape. And it's so inadequate. You wouldn't accept this from a local hospital. So why is it acceptable for a local health department to function this way? Jeanette Kowalik has seen what could go wrong when a pandemic hits as the former commissioner of health for the city of Milwaukee at the outbreak of COVID-19. We knew that we were understaffed. We knew that our systems were antiquated. I mean, we didn't even have an electronic health record. The other thing is looking at other uh, types of support services and health department, such as a communications department. We literally had one person. If you invest in public health um, the way that you should invest in it, then you're not going to spend as much money down the road. And then there's a, the option or the opportunity to have a better quality of life because you address things before they get out of hand. A notion the nation's top infectious disease doctor agrees with. When this is over, and it will be over, we won't forget the threat that we faced and will continue to put significant resources into preparedness for the next outbreak, which inevitably will occur. So I think you made an appropriate analogy, just as you would want to build up a defense against physical threats. We have to have a defense against biological threats. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back for more in the loop tomorrow. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.